to go from being average in this job hunt type scenario to being maybe the top 10 percentile, it's actually not as hard as you think. But now when these big companies have a hiring freeze, that small startup in a state that's in Oregon, let's say, they're not coming to your career fair. And applying online is with 700 other people, many of whom have been laid off. That's when some of these tips come alive. I've gone over this transformation where I used to be the biggest advocate of projects, right? Mm -hmm. I tell people that data science projects are dead and the evolution is now products. So I actually don't think that that many things have changed. The people who are doing, doing the most for this big AI boom are still the ML engineers, the data engineers, the software engineers, and the data scientists. What is next for you? Are you planning to write another book? What is the, what is the future for you look like? I am so fortunate to say about three years since the book being published, I am still as excited about interviewing and technical prep as I was three years ago. Nick, welcome back to the Ken's Nearest Neighbors podcast, the famed author, the inventor slash CEO slash founder of Data Lemur. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's actually Chief Lemur Officer. Chief Please Lemur put officer. respect to the name. I will. I will. I'll, I'll remember that in the future. We'll, we'll edit that out for sure. Um, <laughs> so last we talked, you just written the book. We talked about some powerful interview skills and tools and landing jobs. But a lot's happened since then. I'm really interested in learning a little bit more about the story and the journey after writing that first book. Yeah, it's been about a few years since we've caught up and data has changed. The job market has changed. Um, I always like to also focus on what stayed the same because in a world where things are changing so quickly, we can often get overwhelmed. And I also always first like to remind folks like, okay, what has stayed the same so that we don't get overwhelmed? Because people's first intuition almost is like, we don't even need data science anymore. We don't, the entire interview's changed. And I say, hey, are you sure? Because with the companies and clients I work with, the interview processes have mostly looked still the same. The only difference is, yeah, on the take-home projects, people are using ChatGPT for help. But actually, a lot of those fundamental skills that we had talked about a few years ago, such as knowing SQL, especially for product analytics, product data science type roles, or you know, being able to explore your data well, build simple models for more data science ML roles, um, being able to code well, it, I think that those are still intact and I'd still vouch by them a few years later. So I, I think it's it's interesting that the interview process is lagging a little bit behind where the domain is going. I'm not saying that data science is running away and it's dramatically changing overnight, but I think that there are changes that are happening in the field that are not yet reflected in the interview process. And I'm not necessarily sure that's a good thing. I think it might actually even be a bad thing. Yeah, so I'll give you one example is for take-home projects, enough companies say don't use ChatGPT or Claude, or even worse, they leave it ambiguous. And then the interviewees, they feel guilty or they feel like they have to hide it or they don't use it even though they're used to using it. And I think just if companies outwardly said, hey, we know on the job you're gonna be using coding tools to assist you that are AI powered, so go nuts on this challenge too. I think that level of transparency and that level of directness is appreciated. Um, and I think more companies can do that. Some have been doing that, but I think more can just embrace it and just admit, hey, I think you're probably gonna use chat GPT, so go for it, like, it's okay. Yeah. And what we've noticed even in the hackathon that we saw the uh, so you think you can analyze everyone was allowed to use uh, tools ai tools chat gpt cloud whatever it might be and it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a superior product it doesn't necessarily mean that everything is going to work out of the gate especially when you're trying to do new things and to innovate which is what i would hope a lot of data scientists are trying to do is approach problems differently and really problem solve in their domain so it's funny to me that there is that ambiguity when this seems like almost an inevitability to me where people are going to be going hybrid with using these tools and their philosophy. And the fact that companies are hesitant to implement that, it might tell you something about the company you're applying for if, sure, they're, hesitant yeah. to, if they're hesitant to adopt or be open to these tools even in the interview process. Right, absolutely, because it's pretty obvious from the candidate side 
where the technology is going and hey, you know, all these people are using it. So it's weird for a company to be hesitant. And you're right, that could be a potential signal. But um, thankfully, I think I've seen it changing even in the last year, people's impressions um, and attitudes towards this a year ago. It was just, hey, let's not use these because we don't even know what to do. And now a year later with ChatGPT, Claude having grown even more, GitHub Copilot, I think companies are starting to embrace it more. I just wish it was more explicit. Hey, you can do this, you know, or if they're saying that they're, if they're going to tell you we have a SQL assessment through HackerRank, do not use an AI tool. I wish they were more clear on why that's the case or people would understand, oh, in this company, knowing SQL really, really well is very important in this dialect for X reason. So that's why we're telling you to not use these tools. You know, that clarity would be important. Um, that makes total sense to me. Before we go down more of the interview and career track, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your story after writing the book. And you know, what has transpired after that? I hear you're working with a lot more schools. I see you on LinkedIn. Yet. Harvard or whatever it is, giving yeah. talks, that seems really interesting. What is that lifestyle like? It's It's been great. I've been able to do speaking engagements with Columbia, Harvard, MIT, University of Iowa, Boston University, talking with MSBA grads, master's in data science grads, CS undergrads about job hunting in data, in ML, in data analytics. Um, it's been really, really interesting to see the difference between the advice career counselors or career offices give versus the advice I give. Um, in some places, our advice differs. So that's been interesting. And then the other place that I've been noticing something cool is often my advice is the same. But because I have this back background as ex-Facebook, because I am younger, because I use memes and curse a little bit in my talks and I meet people where they're at, I might still have the same advice as what your career counselor would say, but I am able to get through to these grad students often who are about the same age as me, much more better than, um, you know, simply them reading a career advice blog. So what, do, how does your advice generally differ? So first question, have you talked at the University of Virginia yet? What's that, what's going on there? Yeah. Oh, I definitely have. Okay, yeah, yeah. 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 Just making sure. And then second, um, I'm interested in how your advice differs sometimes from the career counselors. So I think I'm a lot more focused on cold email networking and telling people you can make your own opportunities. I think that uh, career offices talk about it too, a little bit, but they talk about it in the context of come to our campus career fair and talk with our sponsored employers. Come, uh, talk to our alumni and I let people know you, yes, going to career fair helps working with your campus resources help, but these tactics, you can, you don't even need your school network, right? The last places I got hired were not on the pedigree of my school. They were not campus placements, you know, it's, it's with strangers that I sent cold emails to, or maybe a friend referred me, but that friend was someone I'd done a hackathon with has nothing to do with my college. So that's one thing, that's just uh, something that's different. And then the other thing that is different when I, uh, advice wise, is a lot of these career counselors do not understand how tough preparing for the technical interview is because a lot of them never had to do a technical interview. So in theory, they understand, oh, you know, I heard there's a technical interview concept, we'll spend five hours on it, but they don't understand truly oh yeah, like if you're used to doing a lot of stuff in Python and Pandas, and now you have to start giving SQL interviews, SQL is not super hard, but like, yeah, running through 50 questions can take 20, 30 hours of work, which could take a candidate or a student four, five, six, seven weeks of like thorough practice to be able to solve these hacker rank challenges that Meta, Snapchat, Google, Amazon give when they're looking for data analysts and data science talent. So I think that these recruit, uh, the folks who work at the universities, they understand networking because they had to network for jobs, but they still do not understand how hard these technical interviews can be because most of them did not study engineering, right? They're more studying education or career counseling. This episode of Kansas Neighbors is brought to you by Z by HP. 
HP's high compute, workstation grade, a lot of products and solutions. Z is specifically made for high performance data science solutions, and I personally use the ZBook Studio and the Z8 workstation. I really love that the Z workstations can come standard with Linux or WSL2, and they can be configured with the Data Science Software Stack Manager. With the Software Stack Manager, you can get right to the work of doing data science on day one without the overhead of having to completely reconfigure your new machine. Now back to our show. I'd love to get your thoughts on the difference between a, for example, a school networks job and the bigger network. My hypothesis is that those are two different pools roughly and where you stand in your school can have a pretty interesting impact on both of those. So if you're a dominant student, you're a very good candidate for your school, you probably have a better opportunity in a smaller pond of the market, which is your school and the candidate pool that they're selecting from. Because at least when I was doing consulting, they would say, hey, we'll probably hire three to four people from the school. And it's almost guaranteed unless they're all like unbelievably bad. Right. And so you might have a better chance if you're just dominating your class and you're better than the other candidates there. But if you're in the middle of the pack and it's a very high demanding job, you might actually have a better opportunity going through the general pipeline than applying through the school just because the unique differentiation. I would like to respectfully disagree. No, I, this and, is hypothesis. And this is my own experiences, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, what I've found is if you are a middle of the road student, you're at your college, you go to your career fair, there's 20 companies that are already wanting to hire people from your college, it's fine. But I went to the University of Virginia, as did you. It's a good school, but it's not like a big, heavy engineering school. It's not that well represented on West Coast, big tech, fan type companies. So what I've found is using your school network and using the career fair is great for the average type students. But at that top end, students are not told, hey, you can go cold email entrepreneurs. You can go cold email me, nick at datalemur.com and tell me how you're going to help me. And I will respond to that. If you're an average student and you're just like, oh, yes, I have a 3.7 GPA. Mm, that's not going to be a great cold email. But if you're at that top end where it's like, oh, yeah, I ran a startup or, hey, I've done two really cool things. Oh, well, I run a podcast. Nick, do you need help in content and video? That's where the cold email starts to really work. And I love focusing on the top end because I was someone who felt like, hey, I don't want a job in the DC area when I was at UVA. I don't want a job at Deloitte. I want to be doing cutting edge tech at Fang and those opportunities. I want to work in Silicon Valley startups. So I like this advice actually more for the top end students and spiritually that's who I identify with. I identify with people who are really aggressively trying to do better. Um, because again, if, you're, if that doesn't describe you, this book is going to suck. 301 pages, it's boring. It's a lot of work. I spiritually wrote this book for people who are trying to go beyond what people have prescribed them to do, to work at companies that are more competitive than they thought they could work at or get jobs that they didn't think that they're qualified for. That's been my career. I've been able to get really cool opportunities um, and I wish and I like to help that kind of persona the most with some of my advice. I think that makes a ton of sense. What should the, maybe the people that don't fall into that group do and how should they approach this problem? Are they, you know, essentially designed to failure or is there other options and avenues they have? Absolutely not. So as, as much as I say that I spiritually align with these top performers, obviously most people are normal. Most people are average and that's totally okay. I'm average in about 98% of the things I do. What I would like to tell people is to go from being average in this job hunt type scenario to being maybe the 90th percentile or like top 10 percentile would be, it's actually not as hard as you think, okay? I keep talking to folks who don't have a portfolio project, not two, not three, not four, just one portfolio project with a link. I have done talks at different conferences including, um, where was this recently? At Carnegie Mellon's uh, Tepper Business School um, for their MSBA program, where I had everyone stand up and I had them say, okay, in this room, there's a hundred of us. How many of y'all have a project on your resume? Maybe only half are standing. Then I say, okay, how many of y'all have a link to that project on your resume? About half the more people sit down 
So now we're at like one fourth of the people who have a link. And I say, of those people who have a link, how many do you have a link to something where if I click it, I'll be able to see something that I can understand within a minute. Meaning not a GitHub repo with 700 files. I mean to say it's a dashboard, it's a functioning website, it's a visualization, whatever it is. Something where I'm like, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, you made something. Okay, I understand what this is in like 10 seconds or in a minute. I think that's like about 5% of people were left standing in a room of 100 people. And this is Carnegie Mellon, great school, MSBA, Tepper, great brands. So what I always tell people who may identify with being more typical is if you could even just make one compelling dashboard using Quarto or Shiny, maybe Tableau Public, Streamlit, all great options, just get one good public data viz so that you can talk to employers like, oh, and when the employer says, hey, do you have data viz skills? Instead of everyone else lying their ass off and say, oh yeah, I love data viz. You're like, yes, uh, do you mind if I share screen? I actually have a dashboard pulled up. It's really fun, I did this, this, this. That makes the world of difference I've seen. And so few people have that ability to be like, oh, you know, oh yeah, yeah, I, 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 I resonate with what you're doing. Actually, I did something cool. See, Ken, in our, a lot of our conversations with creators, why it's so fun for me is because I'll say, oh, how do you like YouTube or what are you doing? And they'll pull up their own YouTube video and you'll see, oh, 215,000 subscribers. Ken, you ask me, oh, how do you think about writing? I'll hold up my book. Oh yeah, so here's how I thought about writing this 301 page book. The point is the ability to just pick up something and show people is so powerful whether it's creators or whether you're on the job hunt. So when it comes time to interview and you just have something to talk about that's not an assigned school project, that's not some boring GitHub repo, just something you can show like, yeah, in my own interest, I analyzed some golfing data, put it in Tableau or made the shiny uh, app. It speaks volumes to your go-getterness and your technical skills and just your passion. And I just think if you just even did that poorly, Right. Even if your analysis was bad, your data visualization looked okay. You're still ahead of you're still ahead of of ninety percent of people. Yeah. So something I really want to double click on is what you're talking about between the twenty five percent and the five percent. Yeah. Where they have something that's usable, usable a dashboard or whatever it might be. I've gone over this transformation where I used to be the biggest advocate of projects, right? Mm -hmm. And I tell people that data science projects are dead. Okay. And the evolution is now products. Okay. And the evolution, the difference between a project and a product is a project is a GitHub repo with an insight. A product is something you can use and interact with and has an end user in mind. Absolutely. And to me, that is the differentiator between great candidates and good candidates. Absolutely. And the great candidates are the ones that get a job. Something I've been saying a a lot, this is probably people are probably going to be tired of of hearing this aspect, but the data job market, each individual interview is a maximization problem. Mm -hmm. It is not necessarily a optimization problem over the long run. So you don't want to be the 80th best candidate. I mean, the eighth, sorry, the a top five candidate or a top 10 candidate in every one, you want to be a top three candidate in a couple of them. Right. Okay. And I think that that's fundamentally different than how people view it. And the way that you do that is through products, but it's also through originality in some yeah. different way. And that is overlooked. Everyone wants to build a portfolio. Everyone wants to do things that other people are doing. And in truth, you become a top three candidate by doing things that other people are not doing. Absolutely. And I would like to tell people, because I think about this from being a content creator on LinkedIn and writing this book, even though I'm not really a content person or creative person. I wouldn't have said that five, 10 years ago when I was like just studying engineering. Uh, now I think a lot about originality and creating something, whether that's a written piece or a portfolio project or portfolio product. I think that people get scared with the word originality. And I don't know if you really mean originality because whenever I tell people to make an original project, it literally doesn't mean groundbreaking research. It literally doesn't mean you used a data set the world has never ever seen. There are still so many interesting things you can do where you take someone else's work 
or someone else's tutorial. You do 80% of what they did, but that last 20, 30%, you take it in a different direction or you combine it with some other data set and then you add value. Just this weekend, we did a hackathon sponsored by Posit where they gave us data about bike sharing and asked us to visualize it. And immediately, me and our team's head, we said, what other data could we join this data with to find something creative or compete and set ourselves apart in our analysis than every other team? So we started thinking about using points of interest data, using restaurant data and mixing that in with like bike rental data and bike station data. But the point is, even though we were all given the same data set, just combining it with some other data set we just thought of, suddenly we've taken the project that everyone else is doing and we've got something new. So again, I want to harp on originality doesn't literally mean groundbreaking research no one's ever seen. It just means you can do something that other people have done and just put a spin on it or combine it or just do it a little bit differently and you'll still stand out. Because let's be honest, I'm not paying you to do the world's most groundbreaking research or like that doesn't necessarily be the level that it takes to make an impression on me. I just need to see a project as a hiring manager that I haven't seen from the other 10 candidates at your career fair, right? Well, I think there's also a life experience element of uh, originality or being different from other candidates. I, I I would like to refine the originality thing sure. and say different doesn't necessarily mean original, Okay. right? So if, you're, if your project or any of these types of things are tr- different, mm-hmm. And, and generally, that's in a positive connotation. Yeah. Then you will stand out from the pack. Yes. And that could come in the form of a project. Okay. But it could also come in the form of, wow, this person who I'm... Uh, so one of my friends, he hired a guy who for his... One of his internships, mm-hmm. he essentially went to some remote island and helped them build their infrastructure there. Wow. And so to me, that is... Yeah, I'd want to have a conversation with that guy just because it was a unique experience. Right, right. And... That's probably not necessarily the most like hard to get internship, right? But it probably showed it showed that he was willing to go out there. He was willing to build things from scratch yeah. with limited resources. It showed so many things about this person that he didn't necessarily have to do dramatically more to be able to get aside from go to a really unique place for a summer to do that. Right. Internship. I obviously had to apply and get it and do yeah. sorts of things, but. I don't think that there's too many people that would pick up that resume and not give it at least a second look because it's freaking cool. Yeah, I, I would I would give it a second look at a smaller company, but I'll be honest, at a bigger company when I've got a lot of things, it's like, wow, you're a Boy Scout. Wow, you're a fraternity president. Wow, you saved some puppies. Okay. Yeah. But I am want to see your data science work because I'm trying to hire you for data science. So I'm team like... That's amazing. And at a smaller company, I can get to know the person and be like, yo, this person's resourceful. They're independent. I want that when I'm hiring for data lemur. But when I'm going back into the more traditional, hey, I work at CVS Health and I'm trying to hire a new data scientist, I want to see an original data science project in healthcare. And it's great that you went to Remote Island. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think <laughs> to be my, fair, my it's, it's one of those where all else is the same, right? All else is the yeah. same. And then if all else is the same, yeah. you're like, oh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, of let's course. at least have uh, yeah. a conversation. And all same. else is never the same. That is, <laughs> that's that my, is that's fair. That's my take. That is fair. <laughs> but yeah. But if we all agreed on everything in every word and every definition, what would what fun would be this podcast? No, I agree. I agree. <laughs> Do you think that there's a technical threshold or there's always so like a strategic minimum for technical skills, or do you think that clients can or uh, applicants can like distinctly differentiate with technical skills? Like, is there a band where you're like these guys are pretty close together, we'll lump them together, or is it like there's always this continuous ascent in in coding skills that you can ev- like thoroughly evaluate on? Uh, I think in real life, there's definitely a big continuum in skill, but I think when it comes to a assessment or an interview, it's hard to distinguish at the top end because it's like, oh, you got the problem right. And often let's think about data structures and algorithms questions, which is a little bit more of the software engineering, data engineering and MLE world for their interviews. Cause that's a big key component there. Yeah. Super it's hard to judge at the top almost. end because it's like, oh, you solved it pretty quickly and half the time it's because they saw the problem in the past. So it's not quite like, oh, wow. You know, there it's a little bit more binary. Like, did you solve it or not? So I think it's hard to evaluate the top end. And 
for a lot of companies, I think it's okay if you don't know their top, top end, because at some point it's like, if we're pretty good at coding and then you can start judging personality or go-getterness or just past experience, and then I can start hiring on that. So I think like, you know, with a SQL assessment, often with hacker rank, codility, code signal, it's like two questions, 45 minutes. And if you solve it, you solve it and that's okay. And, and that's what I'm looking for. I don't need you to be a database expert. I just need you to solve these two questions in 45 minutes. And even if it's a little wonky, that's okay. As long as you pass the test cases and because I just need you to write SQL. I don't need an artist of SQL. So we're talking about evaluation, interview questions. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about Data Lemur? Like sure. What is, what is that? So datalemur.com is a free way to practice for SQL interviews and also some of these data science interview questions. It came out about a year and a half ago and we recently crossed 100,000 users. It came about because people were reading our book and seeing the SQL and coding questions and saying, okay, these are great questions in the book. I want to practice them. Okay, so we'll spin that out. And so basically a year and a half later in our book, there's about 35 SQL questions of which I think 25 of them can be found on the site. And same way, there's about 35 coding questions in the book of which about 20, 25 can be found on Data Lemur where you practice it interactively right in the browser. Um, and the cool thing about the site that I really like is you do not need to make an account to start running code. Literally right in the browser, you can run stuff. Obviously, if you want to save your work and save your history, you're going to need to sign up using your email. But we really made it super simple and super easy that you want to just check out these problems. You just go there. Even without logging in or making an account, you'll be able to start running SQL code and start seeing some of these real data science and SQL interview problems. Amazing. So last time we talked, we were in a pretty big boom market yeah. for data jobs and things along those lines. It's been two years since then. There's yeah. a lot that's changed. How, well, I'd love from your perspective to understand what has changed and what that means for the broader domain, what it means for interviewing, things along those lines. Just companies slow down because interest rates rise and I don't think that there's some big, deep meaning in all of this. I just think, yeah, it's more competitive. And that's about it. I don't think that there's changed the future of data science. It just, yeah, they're hiring a little bit of less data scientists now. I think practically for people who are listening to, this, uh, listening to this podcast, looking for an edge, what I would just say is find peace, find solace in the fact that I just we just talked about how to go from an average candidate to top 10%. It's not magic. It's not going to a deserted island for three months. It's making a stupid project about something that's interest you and that might interest a company and getting that out there. So what I'd like to tell people is, hey, you know, I've been talking about this advice for the last three, four years, but if you want to start listening, now is the time to listen when it is a little bit more competitive. You've been hearing me talk about cold email networking and I've, it's, you know, it's a whole chapter in the book and people read that and they're like, yeah, that sounds great. And then they don't do it and they don't do it. Right. Um, I'll just apply on the portal, but now you can see on LinkedIn, there's 600 people applying for the same job. And before when you're like, oh, cold email sounds nice, but I'll just go to the career fair and at my school at Cornell or something, oh, Meta is coming. I don't need to do any of this. But now when these big companies have a hiring freeze, that small startup in a state that's in Oregon, let's say, they're not coming to your career fair, right? And applying online is with 700 other people, many of whom have been laid off. That's when some of these tips come alive. So I had a lot of people over the years just nod, but now it's like, hey, the blueprint's still there. It's just now an execution thing because I don't think anything fundamentally changed about how you can stand out. Mm -hmm. And that makes a lot of sense is that the people that were getting jobs before, if they're doing the similar process as they were, they're probably getting jobs again, even if they get laid off. Um, something that... I'm interested in your perspective on as well is in the job market, there's a supply and demand. So the <clears> supply yeah. of data science candidates and a demand for those candidates. Yeah. Over the last couple of years, what have the dynamics of, how have the dynamics of that changed do you think? Is it more of a supply, a rise in supply of candidates or is it more of a demand change that has made this change in the market? I think that there's a lot of supply 
and demand has slowed down a little bit due to this interest rate, due to this easy hiring that a lot of tech companies were doing. But the supply, let's say you started your master's program two years ago, maybe the economy looked awesome, right? And how you're graduating two years later for your master's and the outcomes don't look as good. So I think it's more just like there's a lot of supply, especially at the low end for more entry level roles. And the demand has softened a little bit, but the supply is as if we're 2021, 2020, where it's like, you're seeing those TikToks like get a six figure job in data science while studying from home in one year. It's, it's all easy. It's all remote. And the reality is, oh, actually, you might have to come into the office and they're mostly in the Bay Area and they're very hard to get. And you might get laid off even if you get a role because some of these companies that are hiring shouldn't be hiring. And we've seen that in the last year or two where it's like, oh, you were still hiring in 2021, 2022. Now in 2024, they're shedding that same employee base. So. In in relation to that, something that is in the title of your book, it is Ace the Data Science Interview. Mm-hmm. Each of the different disciplines, maybe under the broader umbrella of data science, have different supply and demand dynamics. Sure. So what are your thoughts on maybe the spectrum of data roles and opportunities or maybe even some slight differences how, in how you would approach those? Yeah. So the book's called Data Science, but you know, a lot of data analysts read it, ML engineers read it, data engineers read it too, because it has a lot of different subtopics. But I think that year by year, we're pushed heavier and heavier into a more software heavy role. I think that, uh, so I always advise people like, hey, it's great that you have a great stats and math background, but year by year, if you can keep upping your coding abilities, that will pay off well because maybe from data science, you can be doing more data engineering or ML engineering type work, which is super in demand right now with this whole AI boom and AI craze. Um, so what's changed is, uh, yeah, I just think it's a little bit easier the more software you're able to write. And I advise people just up their program skills. So we talked about in the interview, what hasn't changed. Is that, you know, in, in this case, what you're just describing here, is that what's not changing in the data skill set stage where essentially engineering is a very powerful thing or what, what, what is the thing in the data realm that is not going to change? It's like, Hey, everyone should always be working on this. It's hard to give a big forecast, but I would like to say that I think that having strong programming skills was important a few years ago, and it's still important now, especially for the supply demand curve. It's not like people are saying, man, I wish we had more people who knew stats and math. Cause I feel like there's an army of PhDs in econ and biology and academia who are sick and tired of it, who are very good on the stats math side, but they're like, what's Git? What's source control? Versus on the other side, it's like companies are hungry for people who understand source control or like, hey, it's great that you understand complex astrophysics and math, but I need to know about AWS a little bit more, you know, and put this thing into production. So I think that software engineering skills are here to stay for at least the next few five years, three or five years. And uh, I think it's a great way to help keep progressing your career. I, I haven't heard someone get their job and say, man, I wish I knew more math and stats. That's what's lack holding me back from progressing my job. I've only heard, man, I wish I knew how to code more so that I could do this new data eng or ML eng role. Or I've heard, hey, I wish I could manage people more, like kind of just do these other business skills so I can start my own business or manage or lead a team or start a startup. But I don't think I've really had any one person say, man, the bottleneck is, I wish I really, really deeply understand more stats because my promotion hinges on my statistical ability. And I just haven't heard that. Yeah. I mean, I think that that makes a lot of sense. It's also a little bit harder to quantify too, Yeah, which is a challenge in the market. How do you prove that you're uh, gr- great at stats. How do you prove that you, you're great at? You asked me some tough causal inference problems, and I would fail them. But companies aren't asking tough causal inference problems. They're asking you to reverse a linked list. They're asking you to write some SQL queries in about 30 minutes. Um, or they're asking you kind of open ended product case studies to understand your business and product skills. But re- like for most roles, unless you're doing like an A B testing role, experimentation role, they're not going hard on stats. They're not going hard on der- doing some proofs and deriving some formulas. I feel like you're pretty cued into this, so you're a good person to ask. What are the implications of 
AI in the marketplace. So people are talking about a lot of, oh, there's going to be AI engineers. There's a lot of these different roles that are coming out. I haven't seen anything outside of rumors and like maybe a couple prompt en- engineer. Uh, oh, and that things, was all right? PR. Oh, the yeah. $300,000 prompt engineer job. This is a new thing. No, that's so, I hate that line because that one company hiring one person for 300K for prompt engineering, now six months later, everyone's like, oh, did you know prompt engineering is a new field that could pay you 300K when one company did that? And you know who they were hiring as their prompt engineer? It's not like some random college kid who was like really good at chat GPT. They hired like a proper ML engineer, gave them the title prompt engineer. So I actually don't think that that many things have changed, right? The people who are doing crashing, um, you know, doing the most for this big AI boom are still the ML engineers, the data engineers, the software engineers, and the data scientists, you know? I would almost argue it's on the two ends of the spectrum, which is data engineers who are essentially organizing these absurd volumes of unstructured data Mm -hmm. that are used to train these models. And, well, ML engineers, but also the research side, which we don't see or talk about as much. And quite frankly, I just don't know as deeply because yeah, the that's research not your side market, is right? yeah, yeah. That's a different that's a different ball game to hire for. And it's mostly PhDs. Mostly, mostly PhDs yeah. from really top universities, especially at a company like OpenAI with big research track records and you know, I I just don't know about it. <laughs> yeah, but that's such a smaller market too, right? Oh, that of course, of course, relevant. of course. Most people aren't doing that kind of work. Most people are doing linear regression and random forest or making airflow pipelines, not cutting edge new LLM research. Yeah. So what is next for you? You've written this book, you have data lemur, is it just to keep going on that, keep talking, doing any of those types of things? Are you planning to write another book? What is the what is the future for you look like? I am so fortunate to say about three years since the book being published, I am still as excited about interviewing and technical prep as I was three years ago. There will be another book. It'll be ACE Data Science Edition 2. I don't know when that's coming, but it's going to be the same thing. Not the same thing, but you know what I mean. Like It'll it's be, the same topic. It's the same. It's going to be better. bright red with the same. Maybe a few more questions thrown in. And then on Data Lemur, we're still going strong. Again, we crossed a hundred thousand users. I think we could get to a million in the next three years. I'm really excited to expand the SQL questions, the Python questions, pandas questions. Start adding some interesting TensorFlow, PyTorch type stuff. Probably PyTorch, and um, we also have some interesting thought ideas that we're not doing right now, but how do we bring this kind of practice questions in the browser mentality to things like Excel, right? Or Excel skills more for data analysts, Tableau, data viz, just how do we bring this kind of modality to other places so that you can have intentional practice with DBT or intentional practice with TensorFlow? Because today in the market, You know, there are sites like Data Lemur where you can intentionally practice SQL and Python, but I think there's some interesting new engineering work we can do on the Data Lemur team so that you can intentionally practice skills that you weren't used to practicing previously in the browser. So one thing I think which would be really compelling is AI integrations and to question generation and things along those lines. Is that something you're looking into? And how far are we away from doing that well? Because you obviously have hallucination issues, you all have those things, but to me it is the perfect thing for pattern matching and being able to create similar problems. But I don't know if it's necessarily there yet to be able to to do that reliably. I don't wanna say too much, but we are getting very close. We're doing a little bit of that internally and prototyping some things, but I do see a world in which We have a SQL tutorial that's free on Data Lemur, 35 lessons. I see a world in which we have 10 SQL tutorials, one for financial analysts, one for supply chain analysts, one for healthcare data analysts. And each one is basically the same, the same commands. It's it's all SQL. But the data set we use uh, is going to be a little bit different and tailored to the niche so that the end user is excited. Oh, yeah, I love healthcare. I studied public health. Now I get to do the SQL tutorial, but with data sets and problems that I can resonate with rather than, you know, add optimization, which might excite someone more in the marketing side. So I do think that we're pretty close because again, I'm just teaching you the same commands. Doesn't matter what kind of data analytics analytics you're doing, 
but I can kind of almost tailor the content using some of these AI assisted uh, tools so that it feels like you're getting a customized tutorial to the type of domain you want to work in. You know, let me just ask you, Ken, if I taught you SQL, but I used all this sports data sets, you would probably like that more than my just generic so SQL tutorial. That's how I learned SQL is there's one, I downloaded a bunch of baseball data and put it in a SQL database and that's where I ran all my queries. So it, yeah, there's continuity there for sure. And how I got so into engineering in this data side was my first big portfolio project back at UVA was Rapstock.io, where I'm taking data from Spotify's API around hip hop music, hip hop artists, and how popular they are, because I love hip hop. If I had to do this entire project, but it was about sports, I might not have stuck with it. But because I was like analyzing data about Drake and Kanye West and Future, I had so much fun with it. So I feel like we are close and that we are actively working internally on Data Lemur to deliver this kind of tutorial where for you, you think it's custom built for you. But on my end, hey, it's a template. It's mostly the same. It's just that I can do it across 20 different verticals and there's a sports vertical, healthcare vertical, and there's a vertical for you. So you'll see some exciting things. Amazing. And so before we end, I do want to ask you, Obviously, I had Alex, the analyst. I had some other people yeah. who have products that are similar, obviously yeah, yeah. not the same. I'm wondering, what does that ecosystem look like? Is Yeah, is there the, are uh, definitely uh, other sites that do similar things. Um, I am not so worried about that because a lot of people compare datalemur.com to LeetCode, which has been around for 10, 12 years and very well known in the software engineering world. But it turns out um, there is enough stuff when you start poking at it that you're able to deliver a better experience um, that would surprise people. Because when I started, they're like, oh, we all lead code has SQL questions. But of course, here we are a year later with 100,000 users. People know about lead code, but opt to use us, right? And HackerRank, they also had SQL questions, right? But people opt to use us. When you go on Reddit, you go on our data science, our data analytics, you'll see the conversations. You will see people organically mentioning us, not Leco, not HackerRank, not anyone else in the ecosystem. And there's a reason for that. I know it doesn't seem obvious from the outside. It seems like, oh, there's other sites that do some of this stuff. But from the inside, I've been surprised by some of the different things we've been able to do that allows us to effectively compete in a market where from the outside you think, oh, isn't this just like that? Turns out that's not the case. And here we are in year one able to deliver that when some site like LeetCode has been around for 12 years with 100 employees. And HackerRank has, I think, 500 employees and has been around yeah, since 2008. So what is that, 16 years? So we are able to deliver some stuff. And I'm really excited given how what we've been able to do in year one and some of the stuff we're thinking about AI, customization, and what we can do on the engineering side, not to bring other types of tools and technologies into the browser for intentional practice, I think that uh, over time you'll see how we differentiate even further. Amazing. So the last thing I want to ask is about writing. Sure. So we talked about it a little bit offline. What does writing mean to you? I do not like writing. I did not like writing. Actually, I still don't like writing. I took zero liberal arts classes at UVA. I hated writing. I was the type of person in high school to write my papers the night before and just try to like pad in words and just try to hit the word count, right? I, I could care less. But what's happened over the years is I found out that writing is the ultimate form of networking. It's it, my ability to put my ideas out there and have them being read and resonated with hundreds, thousands of people. The second thing, reason why I really love writing and I wanted to come talk to you about writing is writing forces clarity of thought. We can talk whatever we want. We can have wishy-washy ideas, but until you write it down clearly and I say, Ken, what do you believe? If you had to say here your three values and you describe it in one sentence each, that's a tough task. If I just asked you casually to, while talking, oh, what do you value? You'd say, rattle off some stuff, say some stories. But when I say, no, 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 tell me in three sentences and write it down, that forces a clarity of thought. What, what do I believe if I'm going to put it to pen and paper and give it to Nick? I love writing for forcing clarity of thought because over the time, I've realized 
a lot of people think things, but it's not very clear, right? And writing forces that. Writing pulls that out of you, right? Also, the last thing I love about writing is I do a lot of public talking. Talks with universities, come on podcasts, bother my girlfriend. That's a form of talking, I guess. You are able to communicate and talk better when you write things down and when you've written these essays out or when you've had to write your tips and distill them beforehand, you are able to do a much better job in communication because it's not the first time you're thinking about things off the fly, on the f off the dome, whatever. You've already done that mental work, mental energy of committing it down and trying to distill it into a short um, form, like what do you believe or what do you want to talk or what are your, let's say, three tips for data science interviews, let's say. So that's why I love writing, even though I historically sucked at writing and never liked it. So I would definitely encourage people listening to, especially if you hate writing, to give it a try again. You never know, you might end up finishing and writing a book. I think that's parallels what I've seen with, for example, Jeff Bezos. Yeah. Famously, the Amazon meetings, they read a brief before every meeting for the first five minutes. And that forces everyone wanting to get on the same page, but it forces the person who's hosting it to articulate everything and really clarify the thought. Exactly. And, and and he did that. Bezos did this memo culture because he didn't want MBAs and McKinsey consultants making beautiful PowerPoints that say nothing. He forces you to write down, hey, what do you want to talk about this meeting? And you can't just say, oh, increase company synergy. Right? You read that sentence, you're like, what, what, what the hell is this? Right? Writing it down makes you for, uh, really forces yourself to articulate what you're trying to do in a way that PowerPoints or just chit-chatting doesn't have that same rigor. 100%. And the, the last thing I'd like to, to note is that if you look at how we communicate in the workforce now, more so than ever, it is written. It is on Slack. It is via email. It is all these things, especially with a remote workforce. And so writing can be an unbelievable skill if you can do it clearly because that is how you're communicating with everyone, even in the interview process, even in any of these things, you are communicating via email. Exactly. You are communicating via written word, not right. via spoken word for the most part. So, well, I mean, for the most part, you're spoken word, but yeah. at least some segment of that is written word. I, I would even argue that an interview process could benefit from more written work because that is more representative. At SafeGraph, the geospatial startup I worked at uh, before I started doing all this stuff, Part of my interview was a written interview where they gave me four questions and had me write out an answer that's just three or four sentences so that I could commit. One of the questions, it was an early stage startup, was, hey, this is a high hours role. Are you willing to work long hours? Write your answer in the next, you know, use 60 words or less. Just so that you can commit. Because when we're talking, oh, yeah, 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 I'm a hard worker. But when you're looking at that and you're like, oh shoot, this is part of my interview, what do I write? Oh, I'm willing to work 100 hours a week? Oh, do I say, oh, I'm willing to work hard sometimes? What do I write? Because obviously, you wanna write something you believe in, because you're not gonna just lie and be like, oh yeah, I'll work 100 hours, because they'll be like, you just wrote that? Are, are you sure? What are you talking about? Versus casually, you could say that. So I think written interviews are a pretty interesting thing, and I do think that writing is just as important. And in this chat GPT world, where it's really easy to write random things without voice, that's that last piece where actually being a good writer, having some voice, having some clarity can really set you apart because everyone else's writing is more and more getting commoditized without insight. It's just gibberish and garbage because that's really easy to put out these days thanks to these AI tools. Amazing, Nick. This was awesome. Thank you so much again for coming on. Obviously, datalemur.com. Data you also have the Ace the, Inter uh, Ace the Data Science interview book. Uh, any final thoughts or words? No, thank you for having me, Ken. And it's been really fun to do this in person. Amazing. I'm glad cool. we could do it. Yep.